The wonder of Watership Down collides with the horror of a zombie apocalypse in an adventure unlike any you've ever seen. An intrepid Jack Russell Terrier leads a diverse fellowship of animal companions as they struggle to stay alive in the wake of the brain worm plague. They soon learn infected, zombified squirrels and bats aren't the only threats in this horrifying new world, where only the cunning and strong will endure, but the biggest fight of all will be the importance of having a name. Stitch Smile Publications presents Good Boy, the debut novella from a new voice in horror fiction, Thomas R. Clark, featuring breathtaking illustrations by Jeff Perziak, available right now on Amazon in paperback and digital. This week's show is also brought to you by Kit Power and his new book, My Life in Horror, coming to print for the first time, but he'll need your help to do it. My Life in Horror collects the first three years of his popular columns for Ginger Nuts of Horror, Europe's largest independent horror zine. My Life in Horror Volume 1 contains 29 essays, fully revised and expanded, uh, talking everything in the genre, books, music, movies, Stephen King's It, John Carpenter's The Thing, The Music of Iron Maiden and Wasp, Brian Keene, many others. Uh, the Indiegogo campaign to fund the book is live right now. It runs till the 23rd of February. Uh, so go to igg.me slash at slash my life in horror one, or just go to Indiegogo and type in my life in horror and it will pop up. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother <laughs> What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f***? Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Once again, to the Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network and available for free, always for free, on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene. Joining me, as always, starting over here to my left, Professor Mary San Giovanni. Hello. Uh, to my right. Matt Wilson. Hi. What, I called you Wilson? Wilson? You did. Wilson? It's, it doesn't matter. You know why it is? <laughs> because I'm running the tech shit today. Probably, Something yeah. I'm not used to doing. You just had to say, Matt, bring your laptop. This all would have been solved. I, I was very busy, though. So, you should know, inherently. I will just pack, I will just pack it every time. Every time. Every right. time. Matt Wilson. And, of course, our replacement... For the tech guy who Matt replaced, Kelly Owen. <laughs> no, Brian. Is that right? That's, that's right. Good. That's right. Right. No, Brian. I mispronounced your name. No, right? I'm just here to say no, Brian. Oh, that, that's that's your official role on the My show. My official It'll role no. is to just bring you back down. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you missed the show from from two weeks ago, uh, there's a lot of rungs on that ladder. A lot of rungs. <laughs> no. <laughs> Co-host and co-engineer Dave Thomas uh, will be off. Uh, he's getting his stomach removed. In fact, he's getting it removed right now as we're yeah. recording. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Um, we love you, Dave. So we have no idea what's happening, um, and we won't. No. Uh, so we, we'll, we'll know when you know, folks. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's happening right now. But we decided... Yeah, what the hell? Let's have Kelly come in and replace Dave temporarily. So we'll see. Because that'll be fun and work out well. Yeah, I'm sure that'll work out fine. <laughs> I'm having fun so far, but we're only three minutes in. So. <laughs> a lot can go wrong. In the I next like hour. Kelly. So I kid. Much. I kid. <laughs> you know one thing that won't go wrong? What? Coming up later in the show, uh, director Maggie Levin, her new movie, My Valentine, mm -hmm. debuts on Hulu this week. Woohoo! Uh, in fact, when you are listening to this, yeah. folks. Oh, no. 
we're going to have to work with Kelly ab- about when to interject. <laughs> <laughs> but the mic picks it up. I know. So you have to watch what you're saying over there. You do more than that. <laughs> now, what were you what were you saying about you're not really a Dean Koontz fan before before the? <laughs> oh, look at oh, the face! Oh, look at the Dean Koontz <laughs> and John. Smile. Yes, director Maggie <laughs> Levin. Her new movie, My Valentine, out on Hulu right now. Uh, she will be joining us later in the awesome. show, Matt. Kelly's not in that segment. No. So we know it's going to go smoothly. Yeah, it'll be yeah. fine. Almost as smooth as watching you two set this up without the tech guy. <laughs> Ooh, burn. It is a burn. Hi, Kelly's burn. here. <laughs> I believe I can say I got it working. You, you did, did get it working. You did. Yeah. You did. You did. It and did your you job have... is to watch the light. <laughs> I'm no. watching the light. Now, I'm curious. Last week's show, of course, uh, with Joe Hill and Christopher yeah. Golden. I recorded that myself. Yes, you did. At Joe's house. I had the the microphone that we're using. Because we, we're not in the studio right now, folks. No. We're, we're in the living room. Um, so I had that. And I had two portables uh-huh. going. Did you have any trouble with that file? No. I mean, I, did you listen to it? <laughs> to the show after it aired? Yeah. I mean, I was there this for I, I was there when we were recording. Well, I'm here too, but I listen. I, I no, feel but, like this is like. You know, I mean, I have to. Well, because like masculinity's been impinged. Because upon. we ended up like having to split it into two <laughs> files, and I just it yeah. went fine. Yeah. So, all right. Well, so, see, I can do it. How about you stuff. out there, listeners? How did you like the episode? I, I, did it I sound good? If they heard the episode. Then it worked. Did you enjoy the episode? I enjoyed it very much, yeah. yes. Yeah. I wish I was there, but I understand why I wasn't. Yeah. So, it's Did fine. Did you learn anything new as a... As a, as a, uh, a I learned to writer. stay out of comic books. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> then we did our job. Uh, speaking of both comic books and Joe and Chris, I want to remind folks uh, that Maggie's movie, My Valentine, is not the only thing coming out this no. week. No. Uh, Lock and Key debuts on Netflix. Chris's novel, The Pandora Room, comes out in paperback. Yep. So three good things to do this weekend. Uh, but yes, comic books. Uh, if you are a longtime listener to the show, you are, of course, familiar with the name Eddie Berganz. Uh, yeah. He was a... <laughs> do that again, Mary. That was great. Yes. Um he was a, an editor at DC Comics, uh, started there in the 90s, uh, up through, up until a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, most infamously, he was, uh, the Superman group editor. Yes. Um, there were countless, and I say countless because I don't remember how many. <laughs> multiple. I multiple believe. allegations of sexual harassment, <laughs> uh, leveled against Berganza, uh, by, you know, freelancers in the industry, by subordinates who worked for him at DC. Uh, we were reporting it on this show in our very first year. So we were reporting it for six years. Yeah, like episode okay. two, if I believe. Yeah. It finally took BuzzFeed reporting on it in 2016, uh, to finally get, uh, of all fucking places. <laughs> <laughs> um, now in from TMZ. <laughs> but yeah, you know, DC <laughs> Try, guys. Yeah. <laughs> DC finally fired him. They let him go. Uh, since then, Matt, he has been in Mexico building homes for the homeless and working as a teacher, including teaching comic book classes. So he's scrubbing his soul, basically. Scrubbing his soul. That's a nice way of putting it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, just because you're building houses doesn't mean you still can't diddle people. <laughs> 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 well, I'm gonna put that in 2020's favorite uh, moments of. The- I mean, because you're keeping your hands busy doesn't mean they're not idle at some time. <laughs> so, now someone we did not talk about on the show, to the best of my recollection, was Eric M. Esquivel. Uh, that's no. because this is the horror show, and he's not really a horror writer, okay? But uh, Esquivel, he was also a comic book writer. Uh, he didn't work on anything really notable. Uh, he was, he was known for a few issues of Adventure Time, a few issues of G.I. Joe. Oh, okay. Uh, he had something come out called Border Town. I believe that okay, was yeah, Vertigo. Okay, yeah, I heard of Border Yeah, now that was, <laughs> that was supposed to be like a horror comic, but we didn't get to see much of it because in 2018, <laughs> Escaval was also accused of sexual and emotional abuse. Jesus Christ. Uh, this is your hand if you haven't been. 
I mean, that's what it's getting to be. Have you been yet, Kelly? No. No? No. They'll never admit it. Um, (laughs) As a result... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my. You know, it's I'm sorry. I'll, I'll right. leave. <laughs> Two weeks ago, when when Dave had his last show and Kelly was here, and I just spur of the moment invited Kelly to fill in for Dave. Afterward, Mary asked me. She said, "Are you sure you know what you're doing? Because <laughs> you and Kelly can be quite volatile course. together." And I, oh yeah, it's yeah, gonna be fine. fine. They bicker. They bicker like brothers. It's like it's one of those like, "Don't make me pull this car over." Kind of bickering. No, I'll, it's I'll more like now. he's touching me. I thought I knew. Are you, I, I you're thought having I second I thoughts. Doing. I thought I knew what I was doing. I, I just want to report this very serious story. Do it. <laughs> I was just. She played. He played. They were fine. Then I played. I just it. bring it a little bit of levity. No, no. <laughs> just a little. You're encouraging the other two to play. All right. I'm just gonna look at that fucking light and do nothing else. That's your job. <laughs> That's your job, engineer. Has the light gone out yet? No. Nope. <laughs> We can only hope. I miss you, Dave. Come back <laughs> Don't leave me alone with these people. Anyway, the allegations came out about Esquivel. Uh, his collaborators on Border Town dropped the project, um, and plans were dropped for him to write the new Nightwing series. Mary, comic book knowledge, who's Nightwing? Um... Nightwing is one of the Robins. That's right. Ah, Aha, good job. Thank you. Also known as Stephen Kozanuski. That's right. That's right. So anyway. I almost said Stephen Kozanuski, and then I remembered that we're talking about, like, actual um, names. Esquival and Berganza, both multiple, you know, multiple allegations against Berganza, a very serious allegation against Esquival. They go off into the sunset to, as, as Matt said, allegedly diddle people. Um... Well, now they're back. Um, Esquival, in a press release, and I'm just going to read it here, he says, uh, it's easier to destroy than build, but this is where we are now, building toward a better future, building with our Latino sisters and brothers, and it's in that spirit that I'm proud to announce our new collaboration, Alternate Empire. Alternate Empire is a comic book publishing company that is dedicated to creating top-tier quality comics for the Latino community and anyone else who wants to read them. Um, He goes on to say that uh, 10% of Alternate Empire's proceeds are shared with something called the Los Angeles Restorative Education Services, an organization dedicated to healing systemic harms via traditional cultural practices. How does Eddie Berganza figure into this? Yes, how does he? He's the editor at Alternate Empire. Hands washing um, hands. <laughs> and, and Eddie is not... Hold on, Kelly. Kelly is ready to attack the microphone. See, now this is why I want you in that co-host chair. But but let's go through the press release first. Berganza is, is also involved, and he, in the press release, says, uh, these last two years have been very transformative for me. Oh, it allowed... Fuck off. Yeah. No, he doesn't say fuck off. No, I'm saying he, fuck off. He says, it allowed to take a very hard look at myself and my past actions. It demanded that I be a better person. It also allowed me to get more in touch with my Latino roots, leading to my volunteering in Mexico, building homes and teaching. The latter brought me into contact with many talented people, like our artist, Jocelyn O-J-E-D-A. How's that pronounced? Oh, well, I'm sorry, what? O-J-E-D-A. O-J-E-D-A. Uh, the J is a, is a Y. Oyeha. Oyeha? The J Oyeha. is a Y. Like, Oyeha? Yennefer, it would be like... Yeah, Oyeha. What time... Oyeha. I can't call Gabino. He's probably still asleep. Really? G- Gabino's still my good. guy. Gabino, how do I pronounce this? I, I was just calling <laughs> Oyeha. Oyeha? Oyeha? Let's call her Jocelyn. Okay. Yeah, that sounds I can good. That. You can go okay. by first name. Um, apologies if we if we yeah, I don't, it too. Yeah. I think so, so. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Berganza says that in Eric Esquivel, he saw a someone very talented who still has a lot to say. We have helped each other out, and I believe we can leave our past behind and united. We can be better people. Um. Then back to Esquivel, okay? And this is where I start to grit my teeth. This is still the press release. He says, quote, 
When I fell from grace, <laughs> Los Angeles's Latino creative community caught me, and Eddie Braganza was a big part of that. Having had a similar experience years before, Eddie knew how tempting the path of bitterness and self-destructiveness was going to be, so he reached out, despite not knowing me very well, and offered to share the insights he had gleaned during his time away from the spotlight, working on himself. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, my brain is oh my with God! All the things to say to this, yeah. and credit where it's due, our friends Rich Johnson. And Jude Terrett bleeding cool. Rich does a much better job of reporting the facts in this news story than we are doing right now. Um, Can for, I just double check a fact? Well, hold on one second. For new listeners, because I know we've picked up a, a bunch of new listeners. Yes. We're over 100,000 now. Here's how we do it on this show. We report facts as facts. We report allegations as allegations. We report opinions as opinions. This would be my opinion. I believe everyone who ever leveled an accusation at Berganza. I met Berganza exactly once. Uh, it was at the, the premiere, the New York premiere of Man of Steel. And, uh, I, I did not have a favorable impression of him. And I have been told things off the record by a number of people who had the misfortune of crossing his path. I believe them. Uh, but yeah, Kelly, you had a question. Yeah, so uh, we're going to go with your term, Matt, diddling. <laughs> uh, when they were diddling previously, right. before they got in trouble, allegedly. before they got caught, allegedly. allegedly diddling and doing bad things and being accused of whatever, because I'm not the comic girl in the, in the crowd, uh, and there's going to be non-comic people out there listening, right. so they're going to have the same question. Before their makeover, were they in like an all-white, all-English-speaking market? Was there a great plan to reinvent themselves in another language in another country and hope nobody was paying attention over here? I mean, uh, Berganza was an editor at DC Comics, so DC Comics, it, it, you know, is in fact worldwide. Uh, Superman, you know, the that the group that he was in charge of, Superman is a worldwide recognized symbol. But you're saying specifically, did they both go to Mexico and, and start this publishing? Yeah. No. I Basically, I think, it, and not to speak for you, but I guess, are they uh, championing, championing the uh, Latino culture in order to get around the sexual harassment thing? So it looks like they're still doing some. I mean, look, good in the world. Uh, in reading this press release, I'm not going to lie, folks. I've never lied on this show. Yeah, that was my first thought. But then, on the heels of that, it's. All right, but you're a middle-aged white guy. You you have these subconscious things like that encoded into your DNA. Maybe that's not the case. Wait, wait. wait. So, so what I, I don't know. thing is encoded? That in, in the, the, assuming the, that the, it sounds like they're the, reinventing themselves in another language. Well, they're not. They're in not another culture. They're not making. Is. They're not making comics in Spanish. No, yeah, they're taking that they're taking up the mantle of one marginalized group. To get around the fact that they that they're suddenly screwed both another that they're suddenly group. both promoting their Latino heritage, right? It sounded a little self serving to me at first, but yes, again, maybe I don't have the right to think that way. You know, well, so well, not for nothing. If I get in a lot of trouble and I'm taking a lot of flack, and then Mary gets in trouble for the same thing, I might partner up with her and put her in front of me so that everyone like remembers shield. what she did while I hide back here and heal. I think what bothers me most about it... There's nine shades of bullshit you know, going on here. Berganza goes to Mexico, builds houses for the homeless. Hey, that's fucking noble. You know, Jimmy Carter does the same thing. Um, You know, he he's teaching he's teaching comics to young people. Yeah. Did he ever fucking apologize? No. I mean, to I was going to say... I don't think he, he did. If that, that it might have more weight if that 10% was going toward, like, battered women shelters. Well, let's or... talk about that 10%. Now... Rich Johnson says, uh, in Bleeding Cool, Rich did uh, his homework here. Uh, you know, you talk about the Los Angeles Restorative Education Service. Uh, Rich did some digging, and he found out that this is a new initiative from the Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory, uh, which, as Rich says in the Bleeding Cool article, quote, intends to provide a focus on career development for youth who are interested in film, television, broadcasting, and content Creation. Now, 
which is pretty cool. I reached out to the Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory. I noted that the Los Angeles Restorative Education Services Program is not listed anywhere on their official website. <laughs> it's not mentioned in their social media. Um, blah, blah. I also, I, I, I tried using the contact form on their website. It would not work. Uh, so I tracked oh. down an email address. I sent an email. I also, uh, tweeted them directly on Twitter. Uh, asked if, uh, you know, the allegations and the, the history of Brigands on Escoval would impact this partnership. Right. Uh, as of press time, we received no response from anyone at the Boyle Heights Arts. <laughs> Conservatory. It's usually not a good sign. No. I mean, if it was such a... I just... I, I feel like, you know, like I said, I, I I think if it was a case where they were, you know, supporting rape crisis survivors or, you know, vic- victims of sexual assault, then maybe you could see that they're they're making some... Trying to make some type of an amends. Not that, not that what they're... Uh, what they are giving the 10% for isn't important. I, I absolutely like believe... is a good thing. No, and I absolutely believe we should support... You know, youth who want to get into the entertainment field because there's very little guidance there, generally speaking. So Here, here's the thing: Berganza, like I said, it's a noble thing building homes for the homeless. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, you know, and in in his his portion of the press release, she at least expresses regret. Now, I can't speak to the man's heart whether he means it or not. Okay, yeah. Esquival, no. It's all about him. When I fell from grace. And he tells Rich Johnson at Bleeding Cool, because Rich reaches out to him. Rich says, quote, I spoke to Esquivel earlier today, who wished to let his earlier statement stand, but asked that people leave the artist, Jocelyn, out of the hazing. End quote. That's a quote. So, bringing up these allegations against him of Berganza... That's not a community service. That's hazing, Matt. Yeah. Hazing. Yes, Kelly. Kelly has her hand up. Go for it. Go for it. Can we just agree that being accused of horrible sexual assaults, rapes, attacks, whatevers, is not falling from grace? Yeah. Yeah, I can agree with that. Can we agree that that term is awful? Yeah. It's, It's... it, is, it makes it sound like, oh, I did something a little yeah. bad that was you know, disapproved of. No, you heard. Heinrich Himmler. You know, when I fell from grace. Yeah, yes. I mean, <laughs> right. Jesus Christ. Exactly. I, this, this, the way I think, they color it. I, I feel like it's, I feel like they, there's. Enough or nothing. When I fell from grace is admitting it. It feels disingenuous to me. Well, and excuse me. No, folks, it feels I like it's been marketing way. team. I think. What what upsets me with this whole thing is how fucking long this all went on before there were any sort of actions taken. Well, because we're looking at like what twenty something years here. Oh God, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, but when did the first accusations come up? Well, as I said on this show, we've been reporting them since our first year on the air. I don't know factually when the first allegation was raised. Uh huh. But that is systemic, not just in the entertainment culture. I mean, we, you, we see it now with Harvey Weinstein. Well, yeah. Others, but it's, it's always been systemic in publishing and particularly in comic book publishing. I mean, you know. I mean, we, we're, we're quicker to crucify now yeah, than before. This but. is certainly not the first two who, who have had these sort of allegations raised. Um, they won't be the last. The there, there are, there are people. With these uh, sort of allegations, who are still finding work at the big two? Yeah, um, it is what it is. Even in twenty twenty, yeah. But yeah, the the whole fall from grace and the whole out of the hazing, I, in my opinion, it, that I feel like the whole keeping her out of the hazing didn't even need to be said in the first place because no, it's like she has no. nothing to do with it other no, than no. your artist. If actually, actually, do you know, know what that was? Was, using her as look a at shield. the shiny thing. Exactly. Yeah. Look it's, at this shiny thing. Look at this young Latino yeah. woman. Don't pick on her. Have. Don't you pick on her. She's our shield. They're putting her in front of us. Yeah. You know? She's, she's That's a, a woman bullshit. and she's Just Hispanic. like Kelly's like going to do to Mary. Yes. Just like Kelly's going to do to Mary. Put Mary in front of me when, you know. Everybody you needs a meat shield. <laughs> I don't know. From Grace. Kelly, do we want to talk about the return of G. Arthur Brown or no? 
talking about, you know, talk, <laughs> talking about <laughs> while, while we're on the subject of falls oh, from grace. Oh, my God. We returns. have not a fall from grace. Um, yeah, I don't know it's that it's... One here's the thing. I don't know that it's newsworthy. Uh, but, but you know, we have reported on him. In the yeah, past. if you're a long time the listener of the show, the reason he even came up in the kitchen is because two other people resurrected recently, and Mary and I were discussing privately who's going to be the third one, and boom, there he was. <laughs> and you know, there were similar allegations against Jared the Brown. Uh, we reported on that in detail. Uh, he was not happy with our coverage, but we reported the facts. When you grab the breast um, of a sleeping passenger on an airplane next to you whom you don't know it's not a fall from fucking grace right well anyway if it's assault if you've missed him or you disagreed with our coverage he <laughs> is missed him. he has now reinvented himself he he has Does gone the the Jeremy Maddox Kevin Strange route he's reinvented himself as some sort of alt right blogger who's going to tell you the evils of cancel culture wow. and social justice yes. and he's out there if you want to go give him a read <laughs> I think that's all we have to say. Um, <laughs> it's been it's been a feisty couple of months. You guys got anything else you want to talk about? January was so much fun. Oh, I, I you can't know what? Wait for February, this was January a great. January was a dumpster fire. Oh my god, <laughs> I like January. Yeah, I really? like January. Yeah. I enjoyed myself. I mean, I got shit birthday. done in January, but yeah. still, every time I turn around, it's like, look at this thing. It's like fucking Christ. February, <laughs> February, <laughs> February Australia is so on far. fire. This is this is what February third. Dave's getting his stomach taken yeah. out. But yeah. I noticed this one. You see this right here? The I'm I'm pointing to a, a burn mark under my eye. I was going to say the bags. My where I got burned. All the skin All has the been skin splitting is, open yes. the last two days. His head, his arm, for some reason. I yeah, know my, what it is. My scalp split open I yesterday. I think it's, it's, dry. it's, it's really it's dry. dry air. It's really, really dry. But like, I need the moisture. Today, I'm, I woke up the today I'm, I'm sitting there working on show notes for the show, and I thought I was crying because my, uh -huh. my eye felt. I reached up, finger come away bloody. Just my skin right under my eye just yeah. fucking split. I think it's the dry air. I it's think it's very dry. your skin is very, very sensitive still. Those of us with hair have you know, flying waves. Those of us with hair. Well, I'm looking at two bald men, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a friend one time who. Who's I had a friend I once. Had this, I, know, I had Mary a friend, had a friend, had a friend I, one time. I had a friend once. one time. When I had a friend, uh, the friend, he, he had said something like, we were talking about something completely <laughs> useless and, and stupid. This is why I don't have more than just one friend at a time. And uh, he says, it's like two bald men fighting over a comb. And that always just kind of made me gil giggle, you know. Two bald, like two bald men fighting over a comb. Two bald men fighting over a comb. So that it's would, like clapping with one hand. That would bring you joy if Matt and I were to throw a comb in the middle of the floor here and fight over it. I would. Be well, here's the thing, though. I don't know what you would do with it, but he's at least got a fairly bushy beard. He could do something with a comb. Look for the record. <laughs> Look. <laughs> I, I had the restraint it took to not mention other things. I had a, fa <laughs> a fairly bushy beard until last week. That's because I knew I was going to be hanging out with Joe. And Chris and Bracken. And last cloud. year when you tried it, I told you to look like Levi and shave it off. Yeah. And I thought, you I know what? Gonna Pictures me. are going to be taken. I want to look different. So I'm going to be the one who doesn't have a bushy beard. I'm going to go with my with my Don Johnson. You look Just very shaved handsome. a week ago look. You look very handsome. So that's what I did. And a little fuzzy. Yeah, it's, it's more. And I, John John. I temporarily had a full head of hair again, but that is, it's, it's all falling back out again. What I need to do is set myself on fire no. once every two years. This is this is and step in for my no. No. Should we go to Maggie Levin? What? Maggie's first appearance on the show. She's like, yeah. why, why did I agree to do this podcast again? Because <laughs> we're fun, damn it. All right, before we do that, I want to remind folks uh, that Good Boy, the debut novella from Thomas R. Clark, is available right now on Amazon in paperback. And on Kindle. And uh, Kit Powers' My Life and Horror is being funded right now on Indiegogo. Here's the thing. I've been lucky enough to read both of these. Uh, I read Good Boy in manuscript format. I've been reading Kit's columns ever since he started doing them over there. Both are excellent. Uh, you know, so please check them out. Support them. All right. Let's go to Maggie Levin, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Okay, joining me now is Maggie Levin, whose very first feature film, My Valentine, debuts on Hulu this week. 
as part of Bloomhouse's Into the Dark. Her other credits include Something Wicked in Riverdale, Diva, The Friendless Five, Vane, This Party Sucks, and Season 2 of Miss 2059, which is currently on Amazon Prime. She's also the creator of the Rocky Horror Hipster Show. Maggie, thanks for joining us on The Horror Show. Oh, thank oh, you thank so you much so for much having, having me. me. So it, It's an honor. Um, you describe yourself. Uh, as, quote, a writer and director with rock and roll roots. Uh, Indeed. Both My Valentine and Diva deal with pop musicians. Uh, yeah. And very earlier in your, in your career, because we do our research on this show, uh, you wrote a musical and workshopped it at UCLA. So yes. is, it, is it fair to say music plays a big part in your creativity? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with that, uh, you know, I'm the daughter of a ballerina and a bassist. So there was oh, wow. just music in my life from probably, uh, pre-birth. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I definitely have found myself from a very young age, just, uh, you know, I've been a big kind of rock and pop music fans since I was oh. tiny, tiny. Right. Um, I spent, I spent time on tour with my father as a child. Um, and I, I think that writer and uh, creator, almost everything that I've ever done, if it's not directly about music, it uh, it definitely has a musical influence. I also did a lot of musical theater as a teenager, so that's right. in there. <laughs> yeah, um, but I'm a big music fan, and I think that, you know, music and cinema are just sort of natural-born mates. Right. Do you write to music when you're when you're working on a screenplay? I do. Uh, My Valentine, oddly, was one of the only screenplays I've ever written that didn't have a sort of constant curated soundtrack. And I'm I'm actually happy about that because the soundtrack that was created by this amazing artist named Dressage is so, you know, intrinsically connected to the spirit of the movie that I, I think it's kind of a poetic accident that didn't right. have one uh, preset with it. But yeah, almost always um, there is some particular curated soundtrack or score of pop music, pop or rock music that I've done for everything I've ever made. Now you said you did uh musical theater as a kid, something else you did as a kid, you got a walk on role in freaks and geeks. One of my favorites, oh. but the show was canceled before you could ever make it to LA. See, I told you, I do my research. I'm, I'm floored that you know that stuff that's thank you um creepy right (laughs) no it's great i mean like this is this is the thing is like when you're when you're coming up in the in the world you're like i've done all these little tiny interviews and things here and there i'm like no one's ever gonna see this and now people are gonna see it it's crazy (laughs) um yes so uh when freaks and geeks was on the air the i was like on message boards this was like early internet i mean i guess we still have message boards and we have reddit but this is long before reddit right um and i was in the freaks and geeks message board quite often and they advertised in there a uh freaks and geeks film contest to reshoot one of the scenes from freaks and geeks which i did with uh with my barbie dolls and a camera (laughs) (laughs) that i made my mom rent from a local video store and uh, no joke, that camera, when we showed up, because we like looked up in the yellow pages or something, we we're like, but video camera rental. And so we go to collect this camera and it is, no kidding, uh, an adult video store <laughs> that's renting <laughs> out this camera. But God bless my mother. She let me rent it anyway. And then I wind, wound up winning that little film contest, which included, among other things, a walk on role in the uh never filmed season two of freaks and geeks that's but yeah it it sounds like (laughs) it sounds like your parents were both very supportive of your creativity early on yeah i mean they were they're both uh they're both such incredible artists in their own right of course and and they were uh very generous in terms of letting me pursue whatever little art hobby I had that week, but it was all pretty, pretty writing and theater focused from pretty early on. Right. Well, then how did you, uh, you know, how did you transition from theater directing and playwriting to screenwriting and filmmaking? 
Um, that actually came coupled with the move to LA. So I came to LA with a workshop of a musical that I had written. And, um, and then when I got here, discovered that doing theater in LA is like not really a way to make a living. (laughs) Honestly, doing theater period is, it's tough to, uh, to make a living at ever. And, and, you know, I've gone in and out of different phases of being like, I need this to be like what supports me. I'm very fortunate in that, like for the first time in my life, very recently, uh, uh, filmmaking and um, and writing is my full time job. But um, yeah, really being here and understanding the cultural and creative landscape of where I was, I was like, well, I guess I better go rent another camera, hopefully not from a porn store this time. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I had written a couple of screenplays when I was uh, in my mid teens, but hadn't thought about it again until I got here. And when yeah. I got here, I was like, I'm just going to get back into it. See what happens. Now, uh, you know, my Valentine, obviously it's a horror movie. Uh, yes. You know, something wicked in Rick- Riverdale, also horror. Uh mm-hmm. So are you a fan of the genre or are, are you a multi-genre fan or, or do you have a soft spot for horror? I am a multi-genre fan. I've worked a lot in the sci-fi space also, and I really love vampires. Um, but I love, I think that there is a sort of a natural born connection between like high camp and glam rock and then a horror element. Right. And I was such a glam rock fan from a young age that, um, Saw a lot of vampire things, a lot of bloody things, a lot of gory things. But I'll be the first to admit that I was a real Freddy cat for a, a long time. So I missed out on a lot of horror that I'm just catching up to now. Yeah. Um, this is tangentially related, but I think this is like a very wonderful time to be stepping into the horror filmmaking space because not only is there like so much to learn and so much to do, it spans, it goes so many places. Um but it's also just kind of it it's becoming like a weirdly newly respected area of filmmaking, which I think it's long deserved. You know, like uh, years ago I saw the invitation and I was like, this is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like we're entering a new era of horror filmmaking and I'm excited to be part we, of it. We absolutely are uh, filmmaking and literature, both, you know, it, I, I've always thought that, the genre runs in cycles seems to be about you know, 10 to 12 years. And uh, yeah, we're, we're hitting a new golden age with, with yeah. horror film and horror literature. And it it's if for old guys like me, it's cool because and I, I have a filmmaker friend about my age who feels the same way. We have a whole new generation of creators who are just now discovering our stuff, you know, as if it's brand new to them. And, and that's yeah. neat, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, my Valentine. Okay, you, you said you you know you've just gone full time. Uh, mm-hmm. and congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank um, you. You know this is your first feature. Not only that, but you're doing it for Bloom House, which has yeah. some cachet. Yeah. Uh, you know it's on Hulu, and you've got my buddies Scott Derrickson and C. Robert Cargill as executive producers. So, I mean, is that nerve wracking? Does imposter <laughs> syndrome set in? Are you like, oh my god, well, what am I doing? <laughs> I can never pull oh. this. Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I would be like a sociopath, right? If I was like, got this, not worried. Um, (laughs) But uh, I think, you know, I've been very fortunate in the process of making my Valentine in that it was, um, you know, it's for this Into the Dark series, which is very, um, it's very filmmaker driven. And it's a real, like risk taking space, I think, for for Blumhouse television in general. Um, You know, they are the team is so willing to go to such like wildly inventive places that it's not like you, like you can certainly fail. And I definitely was like, it's my first feature length project. I've got to knock this out of the park. And I hope that if you're watching the film, you feel that it's somewhere approximating knocked out of the park. (laughs) Um, But uh, yeah, I felt very, very supported throughout the whole process and certainly having Scott and Cargill in my corner. um, That's how I was introduced to Blumhouse to begin with is I met those guys and they were working on another script with me uh, called retrograde. That was 
going to be taken around to different places. And that's how the Blumhouse connection wound up being made. When I was shown the format of the Into the Dark series, uh, particularly I'm Just Fucking With You and Culture Shock, two of my favorite episodes of the series, I, I looked at that and I was like, you know, there are a lot of things from my run and gun digital filmmaking experience that kind of translate directly into this model. So I feel like, I feel like if we've got the right idea, the right area to play within, I can really do something hopefully exceptional with this particular set of parameters. Right. Well, I'm, I'm I'm glad you've got a supportive team like that. I mean, Cargill, my God, I guess I've known him 15 years now, maybe. And he's always done that. I I remember, uh, I I think probably the first year I met him, uh, he, he had come out and support, of a then teenage filmmaker, Emily Haggins. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Remember Pathogen? She like filmed it with her friends from high school. Yeah. Mark was like, like the big supporter of that. He's the one that got that film noticed and, and got yeah. her started in her career. So yeah, I I, success hasn't changed him in that regard. <laughs> no, they, I mean, that is something that has been like, it's been so special, not only to be, uh, not only to just like know those guys as a as a creator, but to really be introduced to the horror community via those two people, right. and to really get like a Ooh. sort of a deeper understanding of what the community is about, which is all to my uh, to my eye, it seems like it's all about supporting different uh, different artists, different filmmakers. Like, there's so much room for people in the horror space with it's been such a like open armed experience. And I, and I attribute that to Scott and Cargill kind of like pointing it out to me and being like, Hey, look at this. This is pretty cool. <laughs> now I want to explain to the audience what's going on in the background. That is not my stomach. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've got a, what a French bulldog there with you. I do. I do. And I'm trying to like dance around him so that he doesn't bark at me. Cause he's like, I would really like to sit on your lap right now. <laughs> and at the same uh, time, my cat is behind the laptop batting at you on Skype. He, he keeps awesome. you flashing. You see me waving. It's me trying to get the cat to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got a uh, cool animal kingdom involvement in this yeah. podcast today. So Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about, you know, uh, when you're doing the digital filmmaking, running and gunning, um, you know, you've got a style, you describe it as di- disco witch. It's kinetic. Oh, yeah. vibrant. Um, were you, you know, doing something for Bloom House, it's going to be on Hulu. Were you able to still do that with this project? I mean, does it, does it have your stamp on it? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Okay. yeah. Uh, I think that, um, uh, can I can I curse on your? Have I already cursed on your podcast? Fuck yeah, we we do it all the time. <laughs> Good, cool. Uh, I think that anybody who has seen any other of my work, particularly Vane or 2059 season two, or my Instagram feed, um, this movie is extremely my bullshit. Like it yeah. is, it is the maximum like glitter neon dancing spinning like ultra kinetic as you say um and just like right in the pocket of my preferred purple aesthetic yeah um and like truly uh when i was originally building the the lookbooks and and mood boards for this film i was trying to take it in a like a grittier grungier direction and then the cinematographer uh, Anna de Mortigui sat down with this like lookbook presentation for me that was all like magenta, pink, purple, bright blue, neon, neon, neon. And I was like, oh man, I love this. Let's just do our thing. <laughs> Let's just do it. <laughs> um, and there's like, it's also for Valentine's Day. So there's neon hearts. I think there's like a heart in almost every frame of the movie. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it's got like really like it's, it's got some deep emotional roots. We're dealing with some very serious issues, but also we had some fun. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> I mean, filmmaking, you know, you, you sit down and write a novel. It's a solo act. Um, a screenplay starts off a solo act. Uh, but, you know, you and I, we've both written solo. We've also both been in writer's rooms. Filmmaking 
It's always going to be a collaborative effort. Totally. Um, team sport. But, yeah, team sport. But when you're the writer and the director and you're making, you know, a, a career move up like this to, you know, yeah. to, to the big leagues, is it is it hard to stay part of the team but also stay true to your vision? Or did you did you not find that to be the case? You know, I um I surprisingly didn't so I I've always been about like the collaborative aspect of film that you're talking about is one of the reasons why I love doing it in the first place, you know, coming from theater, the uh, like being creative in a group of people and kind of living in a zone where the best idea wins. And it isn't all just about like one auteur vision. That's, that's meaningful to me. Like I think that, uh, Cinema is special when the talents of everyone are sort of utilized to their to their utmost. Um, so in the case of my Valentine, like, absolutely, it was uh, a story that I wrote. It was uh, a cast that I had a big hand in, in selecting. But like, you know, I also had producers that were really involved. And I think, you know, I think where we got really lucky I know, I know I got especially lucky for it being my first feature project from like right from the beginning, everybody saw from the blueprint of, of what I was proposing, everybody saw the same movie. So everyone was able to really work in concert. And also, you know, I, I had particular things that I felt really strongly about, but I also was like, you know, you bring great people into the mix in order to let them do their thing. Right. Um, so if, if people had great ideas, I always wanted to hear them. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. So you're out promoting the movie now, you know, you're on the circuit. Um, you've, you've, you found out what, what, what everyone finds out, even when you go full time, it's a full time job promoting it yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, are you the type of creative who always has something else cooking or do you tend to space things apart? What, what, what comes next? Um, well, I am in the, I hope that spot is not the loudest thing imaginable no, right fine. now. Okay. Okay. Um, the cat's enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I do have, uh, other things in the works. I'm going to be working on some other music video projects this year. And I have another feature film, uh, this one in the sci-fi techno paranoid, uh, post-apocalyptic time travel space. Sold. Um, Sold. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that is the uh, what I was working on originally with Scott and Cargill, and then we wound up sort of shifting gears to this movie. Um, so hopefully I'll be making that not too long from now. Um, but yeah, it's it's always I think I'll never be content to just have one iron in the fire because I, I, I don't know. I, I think when I when I no longer have the the itching to do the next thing. Um, then I'll like move to the mountains and turn off all my computers and <laughs> say goodbye forever. I don't know. I think I'll probably die before that happens. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Maggie, before I let you go, if you could, uh, could you tell the listeners a little bit about the activism you co-founded women of action, Los Angeles, AKA yeah. LA. Yeah. Um, yeah. that, uh, well, like many activism groups, was founded at the end of 2016. Right. Um, and it is a it's a group of Los Angeles uh, women and female identifying persons who uh, got together uh, for a while. We were getting together on a weekly basis, and now it is uh, sort of like for big events, fundraisers, or to just have a buddy to do canvassing with or phone banking. Um, and uh, we had a little motto have a little motto which is i won't quit if you won't quit um just to keep each other involved in the long and often harrowing process of like trying to be a part of our democracy um yeah and uh i think most notably you know one of our members started uh an event in it was the beginning of 2017 she held what was called the planned parenthood dance marathon she danced for just an insane amount of hours on a live stream yeah yeah, she raised uh, like I think thirty thousand dollars for Planned Parenthood. That's, that's um, awesome. Yeah, uh, and that actually that woman Anna Lori is one of the stars of my Valentine. Oh, that's um, great! Yeah, so and, you make movies uh, with your friends. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All that's that's my hope for. I mean, you know, I I want to meet new people too, but it's it's always great to get to work with your friends if they're if they're awesome actresses like Anna is and Anna <laughs> Anna, you know, all that. Yeah. Well, Maggie, I really really appreciate you taking time out. Um, and thanks for bringing the dog on the show too. Oh, you're, uh, you're one so of welcome. Our, one of our co-hosts, <laughs> Phoebe. Phoebe is going to love that. She's going to be sad that you weren't here in the studio with the dog. Uh, oh. Maggie Levin's My <laughs> Valentine. Uh, this week's episode of Into the Dark available right now on Hulu. Maggie, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. And one more time, we want to remind you that this week's show is brought to you by Kit Power, who's bringing my life and horror to print for the first time, but he's going to need your help to do it. Uh, the Indiegogo campaign to fund the book is live now. It runs till the 23rd of February. Perks include not one, but two signed limited edition hardbacks, both of which will be exclusive to this campaign editions. Uh, this week's show is also brought to you by Thomas R. Clark's Good Boy. The wonder of Watership Down collides with the horror of the zombie apocalypse in an adventure unlike any you've ever read, Matt Wilson. An intrepid Jack Russell Terrier leads a fellowship of animal companions as they struggle to stay alive in the wake of the brain worm plague. That is Good Boy on sale right now from Stitch Smile Publications on Amazon and paperback and for Kindle. So it's kind of like cool. Call of the Wild and the Apocalypse. Right? Because wasn't the dog in Call of the Wild a Jack Russell Terrier? You know, I've... It's I, been some time. It has been some time. <laughs> <laughs> it's already yeah, been. Okay. okay. I was going to say it's like Charlotte's Web and the zombie apocalypse. Because that also had zombie talking spiders. animals. Zombie spiders. There you yeah. go. 1984. 1984 had talking animals. Zombie spiders. No, you're thinking Animal Farm, babe. Oh, that's what I meant. 1984 did not. Oh my God! I had this. I had Professor this, Mary. I had, this, I had this. You're right. You're right. I had this this glowing literary reference, and then I just souffle it. I just souffle collapsed it. Matt, when you thank God, time. Orson Welles isn't alive listening. I this know. Book. <laughs> I would not be impressed. when you mix the show later. Yeah. I would like you to to sequester. Uh, 1984 had talking animals and give me no! that soundbite. No, I have plans for that later no. in the year. No. no, Brian. No. There was that where I was supposed that to was, do it. That was a good note. No, Brian. I, I have to say that Watership Down traumatized me as a child. Yeah, Watership Down. When you're is a little not, kid, yeah, no, that's terrifying. And, and, and they let you watch a, a little cartoon yeah, about rabbit. bunnies, about bunnies that, and then all of a sudden you're watching in horrors. The bunnies are torn apart. And it's, awful. it's awful. And then you go to the zoo, and in the little petting zoo area, there's a black bunny, and you lose your shit, <laughs> and they kick you out of the zoo. Was this just me? I think this is a generational thing. Was this just me as a kid got kicked out of the zoo for freaking out about the black bunny? I, they I mean, remade look, I, Watership Down. Why? Why would they do that? Are they traumatizing a new generation? Because they're remaking everything. Because <laughs> Hollywood has gotten lazy. I've got a bookshelf for not them. Toy they really they're not Toy Story. They're not remaking Toy Story. Have you watched Toy Story 4 yet, Matt? I have. It's, Did you it's, cry? I cried twice. I, I, you I cry coffee commercials. That's unfair. I don't. I do not cry coffee. You, I yes, cry you cry at the animal shelter commercials where you know. Yeah. Where the, the one with the little girl and the soldier brother who comes home. Oh, all right. Yeah. yeah. That's cute. That's yeah, sweet. you cried. No, that's Toy sweet. Story four. If you haven't seen it, folks, here. First of all, Toy Story, my favorite animated series of all. It's time. probably the best that Pixar put out. The yeah. Toy Story line. Toy yeah. Story four is a, is about. Middle-aged people who have tried to do right their whole lives, but the world is changing, and they're pensive and frightened by that, and they're not sure where they fit in. If you watch it through that lens, mm. oh my God, it's harrowing. It's but heartbreaking. You, but you know what I, I liked that, about yeah. it is that, unlike a lot of movies that are trying to segue from, okay, you're middle-aged now, so let's put you out to pasture and get in new people, this movie wasn't like that. Toy Story 4 actually made you feel like you can be middle-aged and have a whole new purpose in life and have, like, it's just the beginning of the rest of your life, and I like that. I, I will say, without spoilers, Woody made the wrong decision at the end. Why? Why? All right, spoilers. Without spoilers, he said. Spoilers. I haven't seen it. Shut up. I can't say why. With, okay. I think I no, can do that. I think I can do this without spoiling. Earmuffs. Okay. No, <laughs> Earmuffs, Kelly. It was nine years, <laughs> nine years before they, okay. Mm-hmm. So she's been out there, a free toy all this time. A free toy with no kid. Did she ever come back and try to find Woody? No. How would she? How would she? She could have. How did he? Woody, you know, I think he made the wrong decision. 
I think he, I think I, at the end, I think he should have, he should have chosen the other route. But that's just me personally. But see, I think for his own <clears throat> sense of identity and autonomy, he could only have made that. Decision. But I don't think he's going to find that with her. So you don't like his girlfriend, basically. Yeah, I don't like his girlfriend, basically, <laughs> is what it comes down to. Okay, okay Kelly, you enough. can take your I think for the happy yourself. ending that everybody wanted, that's how it had to go, though. But see, I don't think it was a happy ending. I, I cried. It was. When, when him and Woody, Buzz or, or... Woody got what he wanted. Buzz realized that he had to do this, and Buzz now knows that he's going to be the one helping the toys... He's, he's gonna, the new leader he's now. and follow his inner voice. Yeah, he's, he's going to follow his inner that voice. That was probably one of the funniest parts of that following. Oh, yeah, voice. that was great. So anyway. This is why we have Kelly, because when Brian tries to follow his inner voice, we tell him no. You can take your fingers out. She still thinks we're talking Toy Story. Yeah, I was saying We stopped thing. talking Toy Story five minutes ago. Oh, is it, when, when Brian listens to his inner voice, this is why we tell him no. Because his inner voice tells him to, to do crazy things. This inner voice is... For science. My inner voice says... There's a snake in my boot. <laughs> all right. Uh, remember, Stay folks. The water hole. Uh, first of all, our apologies to Maggie Levin. But yes, my Valentine on Hulu <laughs> right now. Uh, Kelly Owens Passages on sale right now. Mary San Giovanni's Beyond the Gate on sale right now. Mm-hmm. Matt Wilderson's Horrors Untold on sale right now. Uh, next week, John Quick joining us. I'm not going to say in the studio because it's still going to be cold. Joining us here in the living room. Uh, weather right. permitting, he'll be returning to the show, <clears throat> and uh, we will see you then, folks. Bye. 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 The Necrocasticon, the podcast that blends horror and heavy metal properties with a common connection, brought to you by hosts Talking Tom Clock, Max Axe, Smoking Ward Hades, and Azriel Mordecai, featuring interviews and more with the stars of metal and horror. The Necrocasticon, Mondays on Project Entertainment Network.